Today I want to talk to you about a simple thing, simplicity itself. You see, in economics, one of our guiding principles is Occam's razor, not that Occam's razor. Occam's razor is the principle that if two explanations of reality, two descriptions of the world around us, two predictions of the future are equally good, then let's choose the simpler explanation. The reason for that principle is partly for our own sanity. That is, it's partly about the cognition processes that you just heard Shelley talk about. We need to filter the world because, frankly, there's just too much input. With billions of people making trillions of choices each and every day, it's frankly impossible for a single person, a single computer, or even a single policy regime to be able to decipher what's going on and then to decide what we should do to enable better choices in the future. So we have to make some assumptions. We have to simplify. The challenge, of course, is where do you simplify? People have a tendency to simplify in the wrong places. And economists, mostly being people, also have a tendency to simplify in the wrong places. You've all heard the jokes, right? The classic joke is an economist, a chemist, and a physicist are all stranded on a deserted island, and all they have are the canned foods salvaged from their wreck. The chemist says, Let's submerge the cans in salt water. Eventually, corrosion will eat through the metal and we'll be able to eat the contents. The physicist says, that'll take way too long. Instead, let's launch the cans in the air with sufficient force so that when they come down from the apogee of their trajectory, they'll land on the beach, smash open, and we can get at the contents. The economist says, you're both missing the easy answer. Assume that we have a can opener. <laughs> You should laugh. It's a ridiculous response, and yet it's a very human response. Why don't we just assume we already have the answer? That will save us the, the arduous task of problem solving. <laughs> this, indeed, is the fundamental challenge of simplicity. How do we make the right assumptions so that we can see the situation clearly and not just simplistically? How do we assume simplicity wisely as opposed to foolishly. This is exactly the task that faces every innovator, every entrepreneur. When they come to my class on innovation, the first thing I tell them is, forget about changing the world. For now, just understand it. Try to describe it as richly, as fully as you can. The world is an incredibly complicated tapestry. If you try to pull out one string and say, this will do it, the whole tapestry comes apart. So instead, first understand and then try to improve. But where do we start? First, you have to understand the physical environment, the social environment, the preferences of the people involved. If you don't understand those, you'll definitely come up with a non-solution but worse than that, you might actually solve a non-problem. That is, you might actually fix part of the situation that people actually enjoyed. This is the challenge. How do we simplify well? One of my favorite stories is attributed to Niels Bohr, Nobel Prize winner. When he was an undergraduate at the University of Copenhagen, apparently one of the questions on his final exam was, Describe how you would determine the height of a skyscraper using a barometer. His response, probably apocryphal, is so beautiful, I tell it to everyone I can. His response apparently went like this. To be boring, you could measure the air pressure at ground level, then walk up the stairs to the top of the skyscraper, measure the air pressure there, and then convert the difference in millibars into feet. That's the answer. 
Alternatively, if you wanted to be a little bit more creative, you could walk up to the top of the skyscraper, drop the barometer off, measure the time it took to hit the ground, and calculate the distance based on the appropriate physics equation. Unfortunately, you broke your barometer. Alternatively, you could set the barometer on end, measure its height, measure the length of its shadow, measure the length of the skyscraper's shadow, and it's, a measure, it's, a, it's simply a question of proportional geometry, proportional math, to figure out how tall the skyscraper must be. Alternatively, you could tie a short piece of string to the barometer, swing it like a pendulum at ground level, swing it like a pendulum at the top of the skyscraper, and the difference in the gravitational restoring force will tell you the height of the building. Alternatively, the simplest answer is simply walk to the building custodian's door, knock, and say, I'll give you this barometer if you tell me how tall the building is. <laughs> it turns out that in order to be simple, you have to know a lot. You have to know all the appropriate pieces of the environment. You have to know science, you have to know social science, you have to know humanities, you have to know, oh my gosh, it's hard to be simple. And that's exactly the trap that an undergraduate student and I walked into nearly 20 years ago when we first started thinking about modeling the Olympic Games. You see, everyone thought they knew how and why each individual nation would win Olympic medals. If you talk to politicians, it was all about patriotism, pride. If you talk to newscasters, it was all about competitive training regimes and your nutritional schedule compared to other athletes. But for us, the answer had to be simple. Not so simple as simply patriotism, that seems foolishly simple, but there had to be a mathematical, simple model. For us as economists, that means putting in economics as the stuff that causes Olympic medals. So where does an economist begin? Well, an economist always begins with income. For surely, rich nations win more medals than poor nations, don't they? To an economist, that seems like an obvious assumption. I, I mean, first of all, they can afford better equipment, better training, better nutrition, but even at a baseline level, the populations from which those athletes hail must surely have better infrastructure, better health care. Actually, just more ability to focus on athletics as opposed to getting by until the next day. So surely rich nations should win more medals than poor nations, no? But to stop there would be foolishly simple. So what else could matter? Well, we hypothesized, let's keep it to a handful. Let's say income matters. Probably population matters. If you're a large nation, there's a larger likelihood that there will be world-class athletes within that population. And furthermore, political structure might matter, the ability for your country to marshal resources together for a particular goal. Climate could matter, cold nations versus hot nations. And of course, whether you're hosting the games or not should matter because the home field advantage is, is well documented in sport, Olympic or not. Now the hilarious part is, in economics, in order to write a simple model, it has to look like this. <laughs> this, believe it or not, is an incredibly simple model. So simple that my co-author, Aifar Ali, and I were deemed kind of professional laughingstocks. How could you even begin to believe that this will do anything. Far too simple. What, are you just assuming we have a can opener? So we took a geeky amount of pleasure spending weeks, months, collecting all the data on all past Olympic Games, trying to test our assertions. How did we do? Well, astonishingly well. It turns out that we got just the right combination of knowledge, simplicity, and frankly, luck. So that in that first run of the model, just before the 2000 Sydney Games, we successfully predicted the Olympic medal count with 87% accuracy. That actually just started the story because over the succeeding two decades, it's gone up to 97%. 
What does this tell you? It doesn't tell you that I'm smart. It just tells you that I did a lot of research and I got really lucky. But together, the two of us, Ifer Ali and I, discovered some important truths. We discovered that income, frankly, was even more important than we had thought it was. For example, Africa, while it has one-sixth of the world's population, has historically only won 2% of all Olympic medals. The United States, while it has perhaps 4% of the world's population, historically way overperforms at the Olympics. 17% roughly of all Olympic medals ever, a lot of that's due to income. If you count down nations from the top of the medal standings, if you count down 10 nations, they're all rich, and those 10 win a full one-third of all Olympic medals on offer in any games. That should sober you. Is the playing field truly level? We found that on average, a nation with $2,000 more in GDP per capita, income per capita if you wish, wins an additional Olympic medal. But of course, income isn't the only thing that matters. Population matters too. An additional 10 million citizens adds on average an additional Olympic medal. Political structure works, matters. <laughs> I say works. It turns out that single party regimes, authoritarian regimes, military regimes do much better than democracies at the Olympic Games. This is not policy advice. <laughs> I'm simply saying that it's historically true. And of course, the single most important factor is, are you hosting the games? The host nation traditionally wins 20 medals more than they would have won were they not hosting the games. But think about that. How often does a nation from the global south host the games? I talk about poverty as if I know. I talk about the income gap between rich and poor as though I've personally been poor, and, and that's not true. I mean, I was a graduate student, <laughs> so I do know what it means to live on ramen noodles and frozen peas, but that's not being poor. That's being temporarily financially constrained. That's different. The only way I know about poverty is through my research. So if you'll permit me, let's build a model together about the income gap. I know, for example, that if you lined up the US population from poorest household to richest household on a football field, the median household in the United States would earn about $56,000. That $56,000 would translate into a stack of $100 bills about two and a quarter inches high. Compare that to the poverty line, which in the United States right now is about $17,000 for a family of four. That's uh, maybe two thirds of an inch of $100 bills. And as you run upfield toward the rich end of the income distribution, the 95th percentile, the five-yard line, has an income in excess of $200,000 for a household, for a family of four. That's about a stack of eight inches of $100 bills. As you approach the goal line, the richest household in America, that stack of $100 bills is measured not in inches, not even in feet. It's measured in miles. And this is for the United States, one of the richest nations in the history of the world. How badly does it reset your mental model if you realize that China's median household is almost exactly where our poverty line is? That is, half the households in China are living on less than that two-thirds of an inch. And China's doing pretty well, actually. The Democratic Republic of the Congo is 95% lower than that. The median household in the DRC is living on three hundredths of an inch. 
$800 a year. And those are dollars corrected for purchasing power parity. It really is as if they're living on $800 a year. How is that even possible? I would argue it forces you to reset your assumptions. It forces you to rethink your mental frame. What do you need and what do you want? It forces you to get really simple if you only have $800 a year. It forces you to think very clearly about what it means to be rich, about what it means to be hungry, about what it means to be athletic. This mind reset, this checking of your internal assumptions is something I would encourage you to do, not just now, but regularly. You see, the theme of my talk is simplicity, and we make simple assumptions all the time. Why? Well, partly because it's fun. Who doesn't like to make a paper airplane? Simple models have a, have a joy about them. They have a finiteness about them. They have a toy-like quality about them. They make life easy. They're also extremely dangerous because simple assumptions are contextual. They depend on the audience. While this is a great model for my children, it would be a horrible model for planning new traffic patterns at O'Hare Airport. <laughs> Think about your assumptions before you address the problem or the audience. So in the context of today's suite of TEDx talks, I would encourage you to mind the gap, not just in terms of boarding a subway train. Mind the gap between your assumptions and reality. Mind the gap between rich and poor. Think about the gaps in electrical coverage in parts of the world that you and I have not visited. Think about the gaps in the roads that have been washed away. Think about the gaps in the availability of clean water or vaccinations. Mind the gap, because it's huge. Do you know, for example, that the median household globally earns $10,000 a year? That's a household, folks. If your household earns more than $34,000 a year, you're in the richest 1%. So, do you mind the gap? I would encourage you to mind it daily. And yet, don't mind it so much that you can't collaborate to close it, that you can't reach a hand across it. Mind the gap so that it bothers you, but doesn't paralyze you. Keep the simple model when you need it, but remember to constantly refresh, check, verify your assumptions. Do I mind the gap? Every day. That's what gets me up and makes me go to work. But in my mind, the gap is important because it's worth bridging. Mind the gap, and let's get out there and build bridges. Thanks.